Um, so as, uh, as Dylan here said, um, I'm going to be talking about the role of the uh, of domestic militaries in the events of the Arab Spring and now Arab Fall. Um, first, I'd like to, to go through some of the, the terms of reference, uh, the ways in which I think it's important to examine these, these, these institutions. Um, some, some of the, the general lessons that, uh, um, and common characteristics that, that I see looking at both Libya and um, Syria and Yemen. And then I'd like to go through the specifics in, um, in both Libya and Syria, and if there's time, um, Yemen. One of the most important uh, institutional uh, questions about uh, an army, any army, is how independent is it from the ruling parties? Um, in the case of, of Egypt, the military's ability to separate itself from the regime um, played a crucial part in the way in which those events unfolded. Um, and this is despite the fact, despite the fact that Mubarak himself, of course, was a highly decorated Air Force officer. They were quite willing to, to throw him under the bus when the time came. You also see this in, 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 in Pakistan, for example. Um, second, uh, cohesion. Uh, what does cohesion mean? Quite simply, do people stick together within the military? Um, and at what level? Uh, in, among the general officers, among the enlisted, uh, among the, uh, the junior and field grade officers, um, among uh, senior NCOs, uh, you know, do, they, do they hang together when the, when the going gets tough? Uh, third, what is the army structured for and, what is it, and how well is it resourced? Uh, when, I mean, when I say structure, what I mean is, is it a conscription army? Is it a, is it a professional army? Um, is it, is it, what are its primary, uh, what, what is its fundamental purpose? Is it structured for internal security or external defense? Uh, once again, uh, this makes a, a great deal of difference. Uh, moving on to some of the general lessons. Um, first, the, I think everybody can pretty much, you know, agree now uh, that, you know, even, even when it wasn't polite to, uh, for people in the State Department to, to admit that countries like Egypt were dictatorships before, we can, we can all agree that uh, these states, these were all police states. Um, and these police states uh, ran on um, a model that uh, heavily depended on surveillance, uh, arrest, interrogation, and intimidation. So it was, it was a police state. Um, and these mass protests represent a failure of that model of control. What did, uh, second, what did rulers do when, when this model failed? They turned to heavy firepower, um, uh, in, an increasingly a heavy firepower, not just, not just men with automatic weapons fired into crowds, but uh, tanks, artillery, air power. Now, many people are, I mean, from a humanitarian point of view, appalled when they see this. And, um, you know, there's, there's an inherent way of sympathy for, you know, you, people think, gosh, these, these poor people, they're defenseless. They're unarmed, but, you know, facing this kind of, of military might. And yet, the use of such heavy firepower is an admission of, of failure on the part of the regime. A regime has to be extremely weak to resort to such methods to control, uh, to, to regain control. Um, third, none of these militaries uh, had any sort of institutional independence from the regime, and not just the regime, but the ruling family. Uh, generals are often, if they aren't members of the, the ruling family, they're usually absolutely terrified of, of the Mufabara. Um, one wrong move, despite their, their status, uh, could end up not just having them eased out of power and all of their, their lovely little mansions stripped away, but you know, they could very well wind up dead or in prison. Um, and this is, this is something very important to remember. Um, in fact, um, I wouldn't be surprised if Mubarak and Ben Ali probably wished that they, you know, 
uh, hadn't let all of their sons get MBAs and they pushed at least a couple of them into the military because this really does make a difference once the, the military turns into a branch of the family enterprise. Um, third, um, most militaries, most of these militaries were structured for external defense um, and thus depended on conscripts. Um, and this combination of, of people who are, you know, they're not career soldiers, they're, doing this, they're young, they're doing this for a couple of years, and the fact that they're, they're psychologically geared to, to, if necessary, kill the other, the external other, makes it quite hard for them to shoot their own citizens, uh, many times uh, members of their own communities. Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And for this reason, regimes are heavily dependent on um, elite units. And really, when they say elite, they don't mean that these people necessarily have uh, particularly amazing training or a particularly amazing sort of physical endurance. No, what it means is that they're extremely loyal um, because they come from the particular communities, the particular clans, uh, you know, associated with, with the regime, um, and they've been vetted. Now, most and most of these regimes only have a limited number of these forces, and of course, there's a reliance on militias, which are often have very little training, but again, have that willingness to shed civilian blood. Um, fourth, um, armed, the tipping point, typically, for the initiation of armed conflict is when the, the military and the security services are split internally for and against the regime. Because if they were entirely for the regime, it's very hard to see something turn into an actual armed conflict. If they're entirely against the regime, it probably wouldn't be a very long armed conflict either. It's, it's the split within the military that leads to civil war. And um, this typically begins once you start to get uh, large-scale defections to the opposition. Um, lastly, uh, in terms of general lessons, this this, this tipping into, um, into civil war plays to regime strength. Uh, in most cases, this, these, kind of, these kind of partial splits um, are only able to draw a relatively small percentage of the military. A relatively small percentage of the military. I mean, quite often, they still have the odds stacked against them. They often lack heavy weapons. They, they lack um, all of the logistics that are needed to keep an army um, uh, functioning in the field, right? You need you need petroleum, you need uh, ammunition, and these things have to show up when they're needed, where they're needed, um, and it it, it takes it takes a, an enormous effort to make sure that happens. Um, the other thing is that it undermines the the moral legitimacy quite often of uh, the protest movements uh, because it suddenly becomes easier for the for the regime. To, to project a certain moral equivalence. This is an armed conflict. There are two parties. One, neither one is any better than the other. Um, and it strips away, and that's a really plays a, a very important part in, 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 in making neighbors and um, external parties hesitate to throw their weight against um, the protest movements uh, in material sort of ways. Um, and this, uh, the, the very fact that the, the regime almost inevitably ends up with the upper hand in these kind of um, uh, conflicts leads directly to the calls for intervention uh, that we saw in Libya and that we're starting to see uh, even in Syria. Um, and once again, you know, once you have that, that appeal out there, come save us, uh, which, you know, uh, was, you know, it didn't happen in Iraq, even though people wanted to think that people were saying that. But, you know, there were these, these, these calls from across society in Libya. You know, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that it's not often, you know, put in those terms, but um, I think it's something that we should keep in mind. You know, civil war uh, will, will probably uh, pull countries down a slippery slope into intervention, especially neighboring countries that have to shoulder the costs of refugees, 
uh, lost trade and transit, uh, and um, all of the um, escalating, uh, cascading security costs that accompany uh, regional instability and conflict. So um, I'm actually uh, almost out of time here. So um, I think I will call it a wrap. And um, <laughs> let's make it up. I think I did. Um, and uh, you know, if, if people have questions uh, about the, the specifics of you know these general lessons as applied to Libya and Syria and Yemen, I'd be I'd be happy to to, to take a shot at answering your questions. Thank you very much. ago, well, before societies, modern societies were formed by science and, and common sense about the, the role of women in society, they used to have the, the common saying that Shashir Afan, look for the woman, and the implication of that was that if you have a problem, look for the woman, right? Now, in modern times, in any conflict in the Middle East, if there is a problem, they are, you know, what the eyes of the of the political commentators and experts on the region would say, Shashir, the Islamists, look for the Islamists. And that's what I'm trying sort of to do today. We'll talk about it a little bit. Now, I'll, I'll start with some general um, sort of notes on Islamism and what are the Islamists. Contrary to the, uh, to the popular belief, the Islamists are not one single monolithic group, and that one or one. We should know that there are a lot of Islamists. And, and they differ. Now, if we can sort of, for the sake of clarity, say, you know, all right, uh, we can divide the Islamists, generally speaking, I mean, and this is what should be reductive, to Salafists and Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists. Those are the two main current or main trends within that. Now, within the Salafists, we, will, we can delineate between, um, we can delineate between the, what they call monarchists Salafist and the anarchist Salafist. And that basically means Salafists who are fine with the regime that exists in their own societies and tend to favor um, an approach that even if they are opposing to the regime, they, they don't want to express that and certainly they don't want to confront the regimes that, that exist in their societies. The second group, uh, which is the, uh, the anarchists, that, you know, a good example of that is Al-Qaeda. Those are the people who really don't think that any of this regime has any form of legitimacy and that the only approach to deal with them is to fight them. Um, so that's, sort of, roughly speaking, what the Salafists are. Now, outside that camp, we have many groups that more or less ascribe to the, sort of, the teachings of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood's main difference from, from the, the, sort of, the Salafists that they tend to be modern in the sense that they uh, they they engage they are more in, um, they engage the world more so than the Salafists. They are not opposed to concepts such as democracy, for example. Um, they they are okay with that. They are not also not opposed to local government, for example. They they don't look for a, a caliphate. That's not what they preach for. They look for yeah, within whatever context or environment in which they work, they want to have a government in that country that is either republican, they are fine with that, but they do believe that Islam, this teaching of Islam, has something to offer to inform the management of these societies. Now, obviously, all Muslim brotherhoods throughout the world, uh, brothers have some link to the main group in Egypt. They are not always direct sort of... Um, there aren't always direct connections between the Muslim brothers in many parts of the world with the Muslim brothers in, in Egypt. But there are a lot of symptoms. So now we know what sort of the, the general difference between these groups. Now, now I made that difference in regard to democracy. The, the Salafists, up to a few months ago, the democracy is a no-no. You know, democracy is not an Islamic concept and we should not accept it. That's their view on it. The Muslim Brotherhood has been in the last decade or so 
uh, not only accepting democracy as the mean of, of governance, but they also accept the premise um, of, of, of uh, what they call the civil state, more or less a secular state. Uh, they, they believe that is okay, that is accepted, that is not in contradiction with Islamic teaching, and, and this is quite present. It has been, um, this is a change that has been sort of taking place during the last decade or so. Now, one of the results of the Arab Spring, and there are a lot of many surprises in the Arab Spring, was that the, the Salafists themselves came out and say they are also okay with that concept. And that's really a big change. In countries like Egypt, they already came and say, we're not even trying to make an Islamist state. We're okay with a civil state. Now, with that sort of introduction, I will talk about the, the two cases that we have. The, the, uh, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood in, in Libya, the Islamists in Libya, and the Islamists in Syria. And again, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is the Muslim Brothers are not homogenous themselves. You know, from one country to a country, you see a lot of differences, not only in terms of the, the tactics, but also even in these the organizational structure is, is different from one, one country to country. And, and that sometimes reflects in the, the titles of individuals it, who take leads in it, one or, or the other movement. In both cases, in Syria and Libya, these movements, the Muslim Brothers and the Islamists in general, were severely persecuted by the regime. And the Muslim Brothers in both Syria and Libya were extremely uh, suppressed to the extent that they lost any organizational structure in any one of these countries. Um, and, and the Islamists, actually the Muslim Brothers in both Syria and Libya acknowledge that and have spoke about the fact that when this uh, movement started, they, uh, sort of the revolution, the Arab world started, they did not have the organizational structures in these countries that allowed them really to participate in the way they would have been able to participate had these let's say this uprising took place 20 years ago. And that's a very important uh, sort of difference uh, to keep in mind. Now, in Syria, the movement saw a change just before the event took place. The Muslim Brotherhood, which is the main organization, Islamist organization in Syria, um, they had elected or appointed a new uh, Muraqib Am. And, and his name is Muhammad Riyad Shafqa, uh, and he's, uh, he came to replace uh, Sadr al-Din al-Bayanuni, is, is one of the uh, leaders of the Muslim Brothers who actually stayed longest in, in the leadership of, of the movement. And now, what is important, what is interesting about the shift, that it came after they had been trying to negotiate with the Syrian regime, they've been trying to negotiate with the Syrian regime for about 10 years. And there have been a lot of attempts to sort of to, to bring the two sides together. And they've actually announced many times that they are seizing all, um, seizing all activities against the regime. And they did at some point in time. But all of those uh, attempts to sort of bring some, um, have some sort of cohesion between the, the Muslim Brothers and Syrian regime failed including one major effort taken by al-Qaradawi himself and, and the main purpose of it was actually to abolish the Syrian law uh, the article 49 of the Syrian law which criminalizes any membership in the Muslim Brotherhood which failed completely and after that, that's when the Muslim Brothers uh, announced openly that they are calling for civil uh, disobedience in Syria and that happened in August of uh, 2010, and that was exactly the time they elected their new leadership. The most interesting thing about the new leadership is that they are all come from the uh, the armed wing of the movement. All of them, included uh, Muhammad Riyad Shafar, all come from it. And and this is this is in complete um, sort of this is completely different from the previous generations of leadership, of most of whom were lawyers, actually including the, uh, the head of the, of the movement, Sadr al-Din Bayani. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria uh, is, is a movement that, that's not comparable to the movement in Libya. The Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Libya is uh, not really as established as a movement as the Syrian, their Syrian counterpart. They are also as, not as 
you would say secular or, or, or uh, would say more professional than their Syrian counterpart. The Syrian counterpart, the Syrian Muslim brothers are quite professional. Um, most of their leaders come from engineering uh, background, from uh, law background, from teachers' organizations, and so on and so forth. And a lot of them are not actually coming from religious background. Uh, their specialties are not in religious background. The opposite is true of the Libyan, their Libyan counterpart. The Syrian uh, Muslim brothers are comparable, however, to the Tunisian Muslim brothers. And that's actually, if you want to make comparisons that were you, so we can draw a parallel between the two movements. And I'll talk about how that's actually important in sort of predicting, if we can, what would happen after the fall of the Syrian regime, if the, if the regime is going to fall uh, soon. And then with that, I want to talk a little bit about the sort of the Islamic uh, movement in Libya. Now, one of the ironies of the current conflict in Libya is that the, the actually the man who led most of the fighting and who crushed the uh, who crushed uh, uh, the main uh, sort of the gates of, of Tripoli, if you will, the, 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 the sort of the most guarded and defended base in Libya was the leader of the Libyan Islamist fighter group. That's the man who led it, and his name is. Uh, Abdel Hakim Bel Hajj, and he's now the commander of Tripoli, the military commander of Tripoli. Now, this is a man who once escaped from Gaddafi's prison, fought in Afghanistan with the Mujahideen. Uh, he also went again, second time after 9 11, but he had uh, some issues with Osama bin Laden and his tactics. But that did not give him actually a free pass. He was arrested by CIA in Malaysia and torched it and passed along in extra rendition to the Libyan to imprison him and torture him again. And he speaks about that actually often a few times uh, since he sort of started the process. Now that's quite interesting. Now he does not come from the Muslim Brotherhood. He comes from a set of his background and from a very anarchist background, if you will. You know, he's, he's, he's a fighter. He's not a, a theorist. Um, of any sort, and he's, but he has changed a lot of his views about many, many things. Uh, uh, many of the sort of the aspects that would have a few years back uh, been part of to be Muslim brothers' views. That's what he expresses these days. Now, because of the prominent role that the Islamists in Libya took, and not the Muslim brothers, the Muslim brothers actually have been only recently trying to sort of, um, in Libya, trying to sort of step into the fray and, and talk about the problem. They did participate in some of the early protests in Benghazi and others, um, but they, uh, they, they, they have not participated as vigorously as the other group, the Salafis in India. But they have called on one specific member of the, uh, the Libyan um, Transitional Council to step down. And that man, and, and this uh, call came from Ali Salabi. He's a Muslim brother, one actually one of the leaders. He's not the leader of the, Mus uh, the Muslim Brotherhoods in, in Libya. The leader is Suleiman Abdel Qadir, of course. Uh, but this gentleman who said it first in Medina, uh, Munawwara, and then he got his PhD from Omdurman in Sudan, uh, he called for Mahmoud Shibri to step down. Now, Mahmoud Shibri is was uh, the sort of the face of the Interim Council, the Transitional Council. In, in front of the international community, and he was also a former member of the Gaddafi Owen cabinet. Um, now they asked for him to step down because men like him, the Muslim brothers, argued, or at least Abi Salabi argued, that uh, they, they are trying to push Libya to a more secular form of governance, uh, which he and he said that most Libyans would not approve of. Now, Abdel Hakim bin Hajj, the commander of Tripoli, was asked what was his what is his opinion about what Ali Salabi said, and he said, "Well, he's free. I mean, Libya now is a free country, so he can say what he said, and and he's free." I have not, uh, he said, I have not read what his the the full interview, but I think he's entitled to say what he said. Now, Libya, and now I'm sort of trying to put the parallel together. If the the uh, the Libyan have not been able to form a new government since they took over Tripoli. And largely because of the, of the difference between the Islamists who are really quite powerful in the fighting 
And as a matter of fact, what they say, we fought. You guys were just sitting talking on your phones with the international community uh, and uh, between the Islamists and other members, and that creating great, great deal of divisions within the council. And let's see what, what would happen. I mean, it all depends on whether they will be able to form one uh, unified council. And, and to the extent that they are able to, perhaps the Islamists, now the, the, the former Jama'a uh, al-Libiya, al-Muqatil al-Libiya, uh, the sort of the Libyan fighting group, they, they formed a new uh, movement. They called it the Islamic Movement of Change. And to the extent that they, the, the new government is able to accept and admit that movement, uh, that, that would determine to what extent we'll see probably some, some fighting, perhaps because unlike Syria, most Libyans are trained to fight. And, and that's part of the Gaddafi larger strategy of the uh, Al Jamahir Al, al Musallaha. Um, part of it, that was his justification to disband the army because he wanted everyone to be trained. But again, as a, someone who came with a coup d'etat, he just dis, uh, sort of didn't want to have an army because he didn't want someone to, to do a coup d'etat. Now, unlike the Libyan movement, this, the Muslim brothers in Syria, they acknowledge they do not, don't have the organizational structure to affect. They took a very guarded approach at the beginning of the uh, of the situation in Syria. They said we're we're supporting, we're taking a supportive role, we're standing behind the Jamaat. We do not lead. We don't have the capacity to appoint ourselves as sort of uh, uh, sort of the guardian of the revolution. Um, we're just one group, and uh, but they have been increasingly asserting their role, and they've been taking more assertive roles in 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 saying that that they do actually exist on the ground, they do participate. But uh, it, a lot of the recent revelation from Wikileaks indicate that the U.S. government believed that the Syria, the Muslim Brotherhood, have anywhere between 10 to 40 percent support within the Syrian uh, sort of community. And if that is an indication, we can say with, you know, um, perhaps optimistically that the Muslim Brothers may not be the biggest group in Syria, but they still sort of um, would play a determinative role in what would happen in Syria. Now, they have been working with other groups in Syria, secular groups, even Baptist members, members of the Ba'ath parties and other parties, to form, to form a, sort of an alliance to counter Assad. Um, but one thing I would not see is the Muslim Brothers in Syria using armed force under any circumstance unless uh, it becomes evident that, that that's the only option uh, that is there. And perhaps there are more aspects of, of this of, of the role that we can talk about in the question. It seems that I ran out of time. Uh, but it's safe to say that uh, unlike the, the Muslim Brothers in Libya, the Muslim Brothers in Syria would certainly play a major role in any period that comes after the current period. Thank you very much. Alright, well, uh, before we open it up to your specific questions, and I think there's a lot of room for specific questions about specific countries and what our panelists think is going to happen in any one context, you'll notice that we have arrayed them. And by the way, our next panel is going to consist of all women only. Um, but uh, uh, so you'll, you'll notice that we have arrayed them in sort of descending order from macro to micro, where we start out with what look like uh, unsolvable um, and very high stakes equilibria in these tribally and sectarianly split societies um, that cause a kind of an international paralysis. Nevertheless, there are opportunities uh, for various levels of different regional actors to intervene. Nevertheless, as we began to scratch the surface on, there is room for um, all kinds of internal uh, movement within institutions, particularly the military. And finally, as we just saw, these situations that look like, uh, from an outside macro perspective, um, a stalemate or a war of attrition, provide opportunities for new kinds of players who might, under normal circumstances of a police state, have had no entree into uh, leadership roles, uh, or perhaps alliances, uh, unpredictable alliances between international regional players on the outside, 
factions of the military or of the society, um, and emergent leaders of the kind that we see um, uh, in Ben Hajj, uh, people, you know, a fascinating character who was actually tortured as an Al Qaeda suspect, uh, and now is the commander uh, of our uh, uh, Tripoli base. Okay, so I think we probably have more questions than answers coming out of all this, um, but let me open it up uh, uh, to your specific questions for the.